completing a Stuart triple expansion engine part 10, machining the new slide valve for the intermediate cylinder. This is quite a simple job, but if you get it wrong, it will not work. This slide valve needs to be accurately machined to the dimensions shown on the drawing. I've already fettled the casting in a previous episode, so it's ready to go now. First thing to do, coat it in marking out blue. Let the marking out blue dry thoroughly, which doesn't take long, it evaporates quickly. Then scribe a couple of lines corresponding to what's on the drawing. The dimensions on the drawing are shown in inches, not metric as I'm showing here. I was only using this edge of the rule to scribe the line. The dimension of the valve needs to be 5 eighths of an inch tall, but this second dimension isn't really that important, a bit more than 3 quarters of an inch is perfectly fine. The critical dimensions are just the top and bottom of the valve, and also the slot that I'm going to cut in it. When I turn the valve over you will see that the sides taper, and I think this is something to do with the casting process, really it needs to be square. But for the moment, I'm going to work on the other side. Over now to the milling machine, and it's firmly clamped in the machine vise. This casting is made from gun metal, and it machines really well if you have a sharp cutting tool. For this milling job, I'm using an end mill, which is 3 16ths of an inch in diameter. When milling, it's very easy to not be able to see where you're going for all the chips that come off. And for that reason, you will frequently see my paintbrush appearing in the image. And here it comes again to clean the surface. Generally, my marking out is not very good to look at. The main thing is though, I know where I need to cut. These are the rough cuts and I'm not going down to the line fully anyway. Before I do that, I will double check the measurements. After cutting across the top, I move the position of the end mill to cut behind and down onto the block to square it off. You don't really need to do this to be honest, but it looks a lot better. And that is the way it's shown on the drawing. Here I've turned the valve over to mill the other side. I'm purposely going to try and describe the making of this valve in a very non-technical manner. When I was a young man, playing in a band on my first summer season, I was struggling a bit to keep up because I hadn't been playing very long. I was a late starter and started playing organ when I was 16 years old, but I've made up for it since. But on my first summer season, I really was struggling a bit and I'm eternally grateful for the advice I received at the time. I was told in no uncertain terms to stop getting bogged down with technicalities and just get on with the job. And I would say that to most people who are taking up model engineering as a hobby. For the next part of the job, I'm using some pieces of high-speed steel to support the valve casting for the next part of the operation. A few viewers have said to me, Do you not have any parallels? No, I've never had any. I use pieces of high-speed steel because they're quite parallel. The dimensions of the hole that I'm going to mill in this valve is critical. And luckily on my milling machine, I have a couple of stops that I can set. Either side of a central piece of bar are a couple of metal blocks, and you tighten these to the table, and this allows for a repetitive longitudinal length. And what do I mean by that? Well, I can only wind the table from right to left or left to right, a fixed amount. And this makes a job like this very easy. I can't lock the other axis though, I can only lock the axis which is right to left. And here we go with the recess milling. Never start the milling on the line, whatever you do, always go a little bit inboard in case when it first bites it wanders about. Once I've milled the slot to the depth that I need it to be, I will then use the cutting tool to size it accurately. I would dearly love a better milling machine and a better lathe. I use these old low grade machines that I've had for many years to show that it's not the machine, it's the man operating it. Besides, I'm not a good enough engineer to warrant a really fancy machine, I don't think. I do most of this sort of thing completely by feel. On a modern milling machine, or even a modern lathe, I could use a DRO, a digital readout, and just line up the numbers. But to me, that's not good fun. And I was never very good with numbers anyway. Okay with words, numbers not so good. To get through the job in a reasonable time, the clips are running at about eight times normal speed here. I only returned the speed to normal for this sequence using the paintbrush and to show the progress so far. The recess is now complete. 
Now it's time to mill the top surface of the valve. I'm trying always to cut in the direction of rotation of the cutter. That way the sharpest edge of the cutter does all the work. And in no time at all, I have an almost completed slide valve. Time for a quick check of the dimensions. The width of the valve is supposed to be three quarters of an inch and despite the camera angle, that's what it is. And the other dimension is five eighths of an inch. I can't remember what the recess is supposed to be, but it says it on the drawing. Time now to mill the other side of the valve. You will notice that in the machine vise, I still have the pieces of high speed steel used to pack up the valve into the right position and keep everything secure. I'm doing this completely by eye, no marking out whatsoever. I'm just making sure that the block on the back of the valve is in the middle of the valve in exactly the same way as it looks on the drawing. After milling the sides, it was time to mill across the top. And here I have a bit of a problem. The smallest milling cutter that I have that's any good is this one. It's 3 16 of an inch in diameter, but these slots need to be 5 30 seconds of an inch in diameter, but I don't have a 5 30 second end mill. It's not a massive problem, it will mean that the drive block needs to be bigger, and there'll be a little bit of side play. But by fitting a shim this would be easily corrected, but I really don't need to do it. As I said before, I try not to get bogged down with technicalities. I've made quite a lot of slide valves over the years and they always seem to work all right. Once again, the milling operation is running at eight times normal speed. Thinking about it, I could have removed the slide valve at this stage and cut this slot using my bandsaw. Or alternatively, I could have done the job in my small Proxon milling machine. But I think this one will be all right. Here it is in its raw state. Now I need to spend some time with needle files and emery cloth cleaning it up. But first of all, I'm going to make the driving block. Where did I get it from? I cut it from this larger piece of brass using my bandsaw. The piece of brass block is supported once again on my pieces of tool steel and overhanging slightly from the end of the machine vise. This driving block must not be a tight fit in the slot. The valve needs to float on it so that it's not possible for it to be held off the port face. I see this problem very frequently in almost the majority of steam engines that I work on. Sometimes your engineering can be too good. That's the drive block made. All I need to do now is drill a hole in it in the correct position and thread it 4BA. As you can see here, and I'm contradicting myself, the drive block is a very tight fit in the slot. But I still haven't cleaned up the slide valve yet using needle files, so once I've done that it will fit perfectly. And also, the driving block is miles too big at the moment. So the next part of the job? An easy fix. I'm not going to labour this part, it's very simple. I just reduced the size in the milling machine. Then I applied some marking out blue, drilled and tapped a 4BA hole in the driving block, and you will notice that the hole is not in the centre, it's not meant to be. After I cleaned up the driving block, I fitted it in position. And here you can see my 3 16 of an inch slot is a little bit too big. But in reality, this slide valve can't travel very far in the steam chest sideways, so it'll be okay. This part is very important. As you can see, the hole is quite close to the edge of the driving block. I'm screwing the valve spindle into the driving block, and for the moment, I'll leave it about halfway in. I notice that there is a bit of an alignment problem with the hole in the top of the steam chest. This problem is not with the hole. The end of the valve spindle is a little bit bent. When I rotate the valve spindle, it fits. So before I put this all back together, I will straighten this valve spindle in the lathe. As a temporary measure, I will just apply a little bit of oil. It's not too bad if I rotate the valve spindle, but I need the option of the end of the valve spindle fitting in this hole, irrespective of where it's set. This is the important bit. With a steel rule across the steam chest, the valve can touch it, but it mustn't lift it off the steam chest. I've taken into consideration the fact that there will be a gasket fitted at this point, so the valve will end up 1 32nd away from the port face. And as soon as any pressure of steam or air enters the valve chest, the valve will be slammed against the port. This is the important part. When the valve chest is turned upside down, the valve falls out. 
and this is the way it's meant to be. And here is a finished slide valve in position in the steam chest. This will work fine and give years of service. I would like to apologise to all the armchair engineers out there who could of course have done a much better job. But this one works for me. That's the end of the episode. Spring is just around the corner. Stay healthy, thanks for watching and I hope you found it useful. Please take the time to visit my main steam models website and click on the section of the website that says video playlists. And by doing that you can find other videos that you may like to watch. And by using the playlists you can actually watch the videos back to back.